Welcome, welcome to a brand new episode of I Dang Talk for Educators Live, the show for the unsung heroes of education. I'm your host, Kwame Sarfomensa. If this is your first time tuning in to the podcast, we welcome you and we hope that you come back for more episodes and more content. And if you are a returning audience member or listener of the podcast, we hope that tonight's episode is one that is enlightening and informative for you to help you grow your practice. So before we get into the main event for today's episode, I want to just share a few announcements. Uh, first and foremost, we have our Adane Talk Apparel Shop, and we're always putting out some new designs for all educators, not just classroom teachers, our librarians, our STEAM educators, and all those within the spectrum. So if you want to tap in to some new gear and and be a part of this movement, you can go ahead to the Teespring's website at teesprings.com backslash stores backslash the hyphen identity hyphen talk hyphen apparel hyphen shop. Full URL for our listeners. And then also, we have a special, special event that is happening right now for our Danny Talk. And this is going to be the Stay True to the Teacher and You Summit. And that's going to be from April 16th to 19th. And you can see some of our sponsors who will be contributing to this event. Uh, Little Justice Leaders, the Teacher Collaborative here in Massachusetts, TECA, which is the Tennessee Educators of Color Alliance, and Innovages, among many other corporations who are contributing to this summit. And we're going to be focused on a lot of different topics stemming from teacher wellness and self-care, culturally responsive and anti-racist practices, and social emotional learning. And we are featuring 20 plus educators from across the world who are going to be sharing with us. And I'm so excited to have one of those educators tapping in with us today. And what's so special about today is it is March 6th. And I know that this episode is not going to release until a few days later, but I got to take this time to represent my people. All right. It is Ghana Independence Day. For those who don't know, I am a proud first generation Ghanaian immigrant. And today's guest is also a first generation Ghanaian immigrant. So we have that in common. And we're going to be talking about life. We're going to be talking about just our experiences as Ghanaians living abroad and growing up abroad. And then obviously it is a day to talk educators live. So we have to talk about education at some point. We're going to get into that as well. So without further ado, I want to bring on my good friend, Mrs. Angela Broadus to the podcast. So let's give her a warm welcome. Hey, hey. Hey, thank you for having me. Happy Independence Day to our amazing country. Of course. <laughs> yes, yes. So it was just perfect, perfect timing. Perfect. Perfect timing. Um, and I don't know if you were even aware that you were doing it on this day. It wasn't, or just a coincidence. It. it didn't click until you said it. And I was like, look at that. <laughs> yep. Yeah, but wow. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I've been waiting a while to get this episode going, and I'm glad that you're finally here. So we have so much to discuss, so much to share. So let's go ahead and, and get started. So first question I ask all my guests is a pretty simple one. Tell us a little about yourself and what brought you into the field of education. Sure, sure, sure. Before I jump into the question, I definitely want to take the time to honor Kwame for just being such an amazing individual and just for the way he honestly just adds value back to others. So if you guys don't know how amazing he is, he is amazing. His character, the things that he's done, the way that he uses his platforms to push others, those unsung heroes, that speaks volumes of who he is as a person. And I'm just so grateful to have had the opportunity to not only meet him and interact with him, but connect with him and to just get a better idea of who he is as a person. So Kwame, thank you so much for 
um, this opportunity and for bringing me on as a guest on your podcast. It is an honor and it is a privilege and it's not something I take lightly. So thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for the affirmation. I take it and I receive it with humility. So thank you, Angela. Now you may you may respond <laughs> to the question. <laughs> I will respond to the question. So um, my name is Angela Broadus. I am a wife and I am a mother. So I've been married to my husband six going on seven years. And I have an active, vibrant three-year-old toddler. So um, that's a little bit about my family. And what brought me into education is actually pretty funny. I never saw myself being in education in the shape, form, or manner. What I love to tell people is that if this was the roadmap of my life, it education was three miles down the street, nowhere to be seen on the map of my life. <laughs> and it was funny because I actually went to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, or UMBC for short, go retrievers. And I pursued a degree in biological sciences. And I had a background, a heavy background in psychology as well. And so I was in the midst of pursuing an MD PhD when I realized that that wasn't the course for me. And I realized I was pursuing it for the wrong reasons. And so literally I had to do a quick pivot in terms of, okay, so what is the next step? What is the best step? And my faith is really important to me. And so, you know, during that time I was praying and trying to just get direction for what was next. And education just happened to be the answer. And so I actually did an alternative training, an alternative teaching program um, in Prince George's County Public Schools District, which is the school district that I teach in. It's a school district located a few miles away from the nation's capital. But um, they essentially trained me to be an educator and I got certified in STEM elementary education. STEM because of my background in biological sciences um, and elementary because I love the young ones. Um, I've come to find out that I like the older young ones. <laughs> and so <laughs> I am, um, I currently teach fifth grade science and I love it. I love the kiddos. And honestly, it's been one of the best blessings I didn't even realize at the time. Um, it's helped me in so many ways, not just in being able to impact other people and sow seeds into their lives that I get an opportunity to see the fruits of it years and years down the line, but also just an interaction. Teaching is the best place to learn your people skills, <laughs> admin, everything, on. all of it, leadership, all of it. And so honestly, it's truly developed me as a person and I cannot be more grateful, honestly. So yeah. It's always amazing how for so many of my guests, education is something that just falls into their lap yeah it wasn't something that he thought about when they were two or three years old and then they dressed up their dolls and put them in the classroom and they had the fake <laughs> whiteboard like no one had that type of story so it's always great to hear how people evolved into getting into this um platform and and just this profession overall so you know thank you for sharing that but one thing that I did mention is our similar upbringings, because I know before you got to the DMV area, I'm sorry for those who aren't familiar with the acronym, DMV meaning DC, Maryland, Virginia, that whole triumvirate, right? Yep. Um, you spent some time out in Canada, eh? I am Canadian, y'all. Well, you know, hey. Parents, they'd be like, you're not Canadian, you're Ghanaian. But I was born and raised in Canada. Um, we moved to the States when I was in fourth grade and we moved to New Haven, Connecticut. It was a very interesting moment over there, but uh, it was, you bring up a really interesting point because of the fact that I am not, uh, I am a Ghanaian first and foremost. When I, made my transition from that MD PhD route to education, it was pretty interesting and rough because for those of you guys who are not aware, if you know any Africans, Nigerian, Ghanaian, whatever, wherever they're from, we go with this. Come on. The top three jobs that they care about, doctor, lawyer, and engineer. <laughs> That's all that exists. <laughs> so we tell them, oh yeah, I'm going into education. They're like, what are you talking about? What education? 
this is not a part of the life plan. And so it was really interesting. So when I actually transitioned into education, there was just so much concern, primarily for my mother. But then when she just saw how like literally everything was working out great for me, we, I, me and my husband, we became debt free. We, we, we experienced so many different blessings, bought our first home and all this jazz. So when she started seeing how like we were still successful and I'm an educator. And for those of you guys who may not know, my husband is also an educator. He teaches middle school science. And so when she saw, oh, you guys are doing well. Okay, I'm going to ease off now. I guess you don't really have to become a doctor, lawyer, or engineer. You're doing well. And I'm like, thanks. I oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't even know that. So your, your husband, I know your husband's a musician as well. Yes. Um, yes. So I didn't realize he's an educator too. That's awesome. And he's also a wrestling coach. He uh, He's a middle school science educator and he does high school wrestling. So he's pretty well-rounded. Yeah. <laughs> nah, that's, that's cool. Yeah, education couple. That's awesome. So it'll be interesting to see what those conversations are like in dinner. Do you even talk about school? It's just like, nah, we're going to leave it at leave it back in the classroom because yeah. just it brings too much stress. No, you would laugh. if You know, I think this, I think that if people were to record the life of a teacher, we would have high ratings on TV because we can't make up these stories. Honestly, there's so many funny moments. There's so many, you're lying, right? That didn't happen in your class. No, it happens. <laughs> so honestly, teaching, you can have a really great reality TV show. So there are things that we do talk about. Um, I think we do get a good laugh out of it. Um, I try my best to, when I notice my husband's stressed out, I try to lighten the mood and make him laugh as much as possible to ease the stress that comes from being a middle school teacher. That's mm. a whole nother episode. I'll just, I'll stick with my K to five. I leave middle school to him, but the stories he comes and tells and shares, I'm just like, I'll stay where I am, thanks, for the time being. Mm. I know people have great experiences in middle school and high school, but right now I'm loving the young ones, so it's been great, yeah. But we do have, we do share stories and we do definitely do connect uh, and laugh a lot, yeah. See, <laughs> see I'm the total opposite because I was a middle school math teacher and I loved middle school. I'm shocked. I did sixth <laughs> grade. I did sixth grade my first four years and then my next five i did seventh and eighth grade math and honestly middle school is where i was supposed to be for sure yeah because i can't do the um, k to five anything below sixth grade i i'm not doing maybe fifth grade fifth grade i, I might do but so below means, that mm. fifth grade is my sweet spot i don't move from fifth grade so i actually started off in second grade and I quickly realized that was not the place for me. So this is the thing. I am a K through five educator, but I can only do fifth grade because they're old enough to get the sarcasm and they're old enough to listen and you could joke with them, but they're still children and they, they don't really sniff themselves and smell themselves as much. You know what I mean? But I can't do the whole, Mrs. Broadus. I can't, I can't do that. Mm, but God bless no. my primary educators. I'm so grateful for you guys. K through two, where would we be without you guys? We need y'all. So thank you. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Listen, I have eighth grade kids who are like 14, 15, going on 30. So I don't know what it is about that particular grade level. I don't know. Maybe I get a rise out of a kid cursing me out. I just you get a rise you, out of it. Oh, because it's an opportunity to go back with them? Like, explain. <laughs> I think it's because, no, you know what it is? It's because when they get to that age, particularly in the environments I've taught in, mm -hmm. what they like more than anything is someone who is transparent and authentic. Yes. And sometimes with authenticity, you have to reveal parts of yourself that typically you don't reveal. Yes. And I, I, if that makes sense. Like, I don't mm -hmm. want to Okay. I don't want to no. spill too much of the beans, but sometimes you got to get real with them and, the thing. and, and they appreciate it. I think that's everywhere, though. I feel like that that has to be seen in K through 12. If you want to earn the respect, you can't just have your position as I'm your teacher, so you're going to listen to me. 
They respect no. authenticity, transparency, and vulnerability. That's how you connect. That's how you have that great classroom management where you're not yelling. Like, honestly, my kids, I don't have, I'm, the, I'm that teacher where my principal will walk into my classroom and he didn't realize there were kids in there. And he was like, what's going, why, why are they listening? Why are they so quiet? Because we have a, we have understanding. Mrs. They see the real Mrs. Broadus. They understand she'll laugh with them. They'll get the real side. We'll do the, you know, we have the, I love you moments. And I, I, I believe in you. I believe in your potential. So my expectations are here because they know how they, I care about them. They're willing to listen. They're emotionally invested. They're engaged. That's honestly what keeps them engaged. They know that I care. So I really appreciate that. I think what you just explained, it's a it's a necessity for K through 12, honestly. Honestly. Yeah. You know, we need that. We we definitely need that uh type of structure and and that stance. That stance is important so that we can set the tone not just for that first day, but for yeah. the next 179 plus days of school, <laughs> yeah. uh, we have to set that tone. But I do want to go back and just touch on your experience, you know, being a first generation Ghanaian immigrant, because I know for me, I had my ups and downs and my struggles. Um, and But I also feel like it has shaped the way that I am as an educator. So yeah. I want to know from you, how has your experience being someone who didn't grow up in the nation of Ghana, like myself, growing up abroad, like how has that shaped you as an educator, but also how you show up in the world, how you navigate yeah. the world? Yeah, honestly, it's funny because I was literally laughing at this two days ago. I had a situation that happened two days ago where I had a student, she is clearly African by her name, uh, first and last name, and she was being disrespectful. So she sent me a message in Google Classroom and it was just disrespectful. And I got really upset and I had to think back, I'm like, why am I so upset about this situation right now? Why is this particular student really bothering me? And it goes back to my roots. It goes back to mm. the fact that I am a Kenyan. And if I had the audacity to try to be rude with my teacher, when I was in elementary school, the consequences were uh, interesting. We had some, there was a lot of fellowshipping. I, I, I couldn't be smart with my teachers. I couldn't get away with all that. And so I realized that it's because of my upbringing and the expectations that were placed on me, uh, especially as a student whose parents are from Ghana and there's a certain cultural expectation for how I need to carry myself and behave when I'm in the classroom, when I ever come across students who I know for a fact that they are African and they are acting out of order, it, it just mm -hmm. runs the wrong way. And I'm like, right, okay, I, I literally have a, I pull them to the side, we have a conversation. I'm like, are you sure you're African? Like we literally go there and they're like, why did you ask me that? And I'm like, because sweetie, that's not how we act or be behave. That's not the expectation, but then it goes it goes to show something else though, right? I have to also be aware of the fact that even if they carry the first and last name that may indicate they're from Nigeria or Cameroon or Ivory Coast or wherever mm -hmm. they're from, things are different now. Like we have, like for example, I'll use my son as an example. I'm from Ghana, but his father is Southern. My husband, <laughs> he's from the South. And so my son is a combination of the both of us. A lot of these children that I'm teaching, they have one parent that might be from an African nation and they may have another parent who might be American. And so the act, the cultural expectations are now different. The game has shifted, the game is different. And so for me, as an educator, I have to be mindful of my biases because it's a mm. bias. And I literally, it's a bias and I have to be honest with myself. I have to you know, know when I'm, out of order and when I'm wrong and I need to go back and apologize to a student for, hey, you know what? I shouldn't have come at you that way because even if you are African, I understand that all the expectations are different, you know, now. And like, just honestly have a conversation and teach them what the expectations should sort of look like-ish. Um, just being understanding and cognizant of the fact that every home life is different. And because of that, 
I have to be mindful of how I'm interacting with my students. I can't just make an assumption that, oh, because they have this name, they're gonna act this way. No. And then also being understanding of when those students are acting out, it lets me know, I always know, when students act out, there's always an issue, right? We know that there's an underlying issue and it gives me an opportunity to better build a relationship with them and try to dig deeper to see, okay, what's really going on? Okay, so you're acting out in this manner. Why are you acting out in that manner? Is it because you want more attention? And of course you wouldn't put it that way, but you know, you would talk to them in a certain manner, but it lets me know that there's something I can do on my end, whether, so if they're lo looking for more attention, how can I give them the, the attention that they need that's in a positive manner? How can I affirm them in the way that they need? How can I meet their love language accordingly? Because honestly, I get it. <laughs> I get it because yeah. you know, I grew up, you know, there were high expectations placed upon me. And because of those high expectations that were placed upon me, um, and because of the fact that I didn't always feel like my love tank was filled accordingly and it wasn't any fault to my parents, they were working hard to make sure that me and my siblings had what we needed. So I was that, when I was younger, I was an eight-year-old student taking care, taking care for eight-month-old sister, which mm. is illegal. We know it's illegal, but it was happening because my dad was a doctor, my mom was a nurse. Guess who did all her homework by herself? <laughs> in elementary school with no help. Guess who did all her science projects with no help? And so I had to learn how to separate my experiences from the classroom sometimes in that just because I was able to make it and I had to prevail through those hard situations, I can't place those same expectations on my students. And I had to sort of <laughs> be more understanding when they want to be coddled. I'm not saying I'm going to coddle them. I just have to be able to get them from that wanting to be coddled to helping them be more and more independent in a way that's appropriate for the age level. So, And I think this is why context is so important, yeah. especially when we interact with our students, because we always look through our frame of reference yes. to make certain decisions, whether it's with behavior or with academics. Yes. Um, I know I came from a household where both my parents were college educated. My dad was an actuary. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom went to school for nursing, but she also took on some other jobs along the way. But both of them went to college. So growing up, my siblings and I, we knew that after high school, we were going to go to a four-year university or college because that was the expectation. We didn't know that there were other alternative routes such as apprenticeships and trade schools and community college. We didn't know any of that. All we knew was after senior year of high school, we go to college and we thought that everybody had those same expectations. But then I become a teacher and I'm seeing students coming from different walks of life, going through different hardships, different trials and tribulations. And I realized, wow, I can't use I can't use my frame of reference mm -hmm. as a way and project that on them because yeah. they're going to be resentful towards me. Yeah. So I have to make the adjustment to their benefit so that they can see that I'm willing to meet them halfway. Yeah. And to get them to a place where they can aspire to be what they want to be as opposed to what I want them to be. That's it right there. Honestly, Kwame, I think you hit so many nails on the head in that you just touch on too many different things. You even brought up the fact that I don't think we always had an environment that was emotionally healthy, where we were always able to express what was going on in an emotionally healthy way. And then you don't realize that until you're an adult that, oh, that tendency is not healthy, or ooh, me not being able to uh, deal with my emotions in this manner, it's just not healthy. And so honestly, for me, I went on a journey after, well, my first year, it was rough. After, <laughs> during, my, during my first year, I was on this journey of just being more mentally healthy, mentally mm -hmm. and healthy. And honestly, if it was not for that and unpacking things from 
my upbringing and my childhood, I don't think I would be able to be the educator that I am now where I'm able to properly see my students for who they are, where I'm actually able to notice that, okay, this, this one particular child, oh, she's extremely gifted in the arts. Science is not her thing. She, she works really hard, but she still barely gets C's. And being able to still affirm that child and, hey, science may not be your thing, but guess what, sweetie? You are killing it in the arts. Look at the way you do music or draw and look at your passions. And honestly, just being able to literally love every child in the way that they want to receive love, honestly, that was a really huge thing for me in that that, that transformed a lot of the way I taught because because I was able to love children the way they wanted to be loved, I had less problems in my classroom. I wasn't your teacher dealing with rude children, like those rude children that other people would talk about before they come to you. Like I would gladly welcome the, the misbehaved students. I love, those were my favorite types of students. Why? Because I had an opportunity to pull out what other people have been overlooking for so long. Mm -hmm. Opportunity to see them for who they really are and to see that, hey, they're acting out in this manner because this is what they're lacking at home. And they're trying to look for it at school, but it's in the wrong way. Kids don't know how to explain how, hey, I'm hurting. Kwame, I had a, I had a student and I'm so upset. I found out three weeks before school ended that her mother murdered her father and her father's girlfriend. What? And she was being raised by her grandmother and she had two younger, she had two younger siblings. Don't you think that would have helped me as an educator to properly be able to relate to her and to love on her in the way that she needed to be loved? People just kept saying, oh, she's a bad student. She's horrible. She's always acting out. Of course she's acting out. Her yeah, mom and right. her mother is gone. Like, come on, you guys. Don't you think that would have been pretty relevant information as an educator that I needed to know? And honestly, I'm grateful that I taught her second grade. Thank God I was able to get her again in fifth grade. I'm so grateful because I had an opportunity to love on her in the way that she needed to be loved on that I missed being able to do in second grade. And I'm grateful for that opportunity because I had an opportunity to be like, hey, sweetie, this is not who you are. I know you're acting out in this way and that way. And this is what people see. But look, I tell you what I see. I see a really bright child very smart, you're full of potential. You're not, and I'm not just saying that you're smart just to say that you're smart, because sweetie, you know me, you know I keep it real. I ain't gonna tell you something that's not true. You are bright, you are intelligent, and like just being able to literally help her see herself for who she truly is, those are, that's a gift. That's an opportunity that we have as educators, and it's not something I take lightly, honestly. I'm, I mean, I, Tom and I have talked offline about how I've tried to escape the classroom so many times, but I'm grateful yep. because, if it was not for God leaving me where I was, I would not be able to talk and speak into the lives of these students who came my way. And my my heart and my hope is, yes, I teach you science. Yes, I may teach you other subjects, but I wanna plant seeds that will bear fruit 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Seeds that will bear fruit in your character and in your integrity and in who you are as a person and how you're shaped. That's my heart. Um, I wanna add value to you even long after you're beyond me. So. The kids know that. They know that when Mrs. Broadus is speaking to them, it's because she cares so much about who they are. And I tell them, y'all, you know my expectations are up here because first of all, this is against us. In our current day mm. in society, I talk to my boys, I'm like, y'all, you can't be acting anyhow. Talk like, about I, it. Guys, I really do. It's because I love y'all. We're gonna talk about this. We're gonna talk about how this is already a strike against you. So when you're acting out of turn and you're doing whatever you wanna do and misbehaving, People are already judging you before you can even they can even hear how intelligent and bright you are. So you need to carry yourself appropriately. We had these conversations yeah. in Kwame. This is like I am that science teacher, and I don't listen. We will take 15, 20, 30 minutes if we need to to have those conversations. But guess what? It always works. And I kid you not, Kwame. If I could show you my Zoom chats from when my students are like. Mrs. Prowse, I feel so inspired. And yeah, we're ready to learn. Let's do this. We're gonna, we know what the expectations are. We're ready to rise to it. Like that's that's what gets them engaged. When they know that we're having these crucial conversations and that their teacher cares so much about them, that she's taking time out of our regularly time schedule to have these mm -hmm. conversations, they're invested. 
they care. And then guess what? That's what they're going to remember 10 years from now. Not the science that I'm teaching them. If I'm lucky, they might remember like a thing or two, but they're going to remember these conversations. And so these are the seeds that we're planting. Man, where's the collection plate? Well, where's the collection <laughs> plate? Like, you hit on so many points. Like, you dropped so many bars in that whole soliloquy right there, right? Um, but the one part that I do want to hone in on and reiterate is context. Mm -hmm. Once again, we talked about context. Yeah. And by context, I mean that you opened the door for that student to be able to express themselves. Now yeah. think about our upbringing as, yeah. as Ghanaians. Think about that. <laughs> yeah. My, you know, my mom was the one who was very sociable, very loving. I can go to her for anything. She was a type of parent where if I got in trouble in school, I was disappointed because I knew I was disappointing her. Mm -hmm. like that's the type of parent she was mm -hmm. or she is she never laid a hand on me she didn't do any of that and that's that's powerful right there when mm -hmm. you're so disappointed in yourself for getting into trouble in school which was rare for me when I was younger mm -hmm. that you don't want to see your mom disappointed mm -hmm. like that doesn't really happen that often in this current context you don't see too many students who who revere their parents to the point where man they get in trouble they're disappointed in the fact that they got in trouble yeah. and then the converse of that is my dad like my dad was the one that was rough he, like I couldn't really approach him when it mm -hmm. came to a lot of things because he was like hey nana you are coming home with these grades huh a, B, and C. Ah. Huh. You listen. You need to do better, huh? You need to do better. Like, that was what I had to hear all the time. Even when I was an adult, even when I graduated with mm -hmm. my bachelor's degree in mathematics and I told my family I wanted to go into education, my dad was like, hey, Nana, so you don't want to be an actuary, eh? an accountant, eh, eh, a uh, financial advisor, you'll get a lot of money. Eh? Mm -hmm. And and for me, that wasn't what it was about. Like, they totally missed the point. Like, my dad missed the point when it came to that. Uh, my mom was a type where it was just like, you know what? Whatever you want to do, I'll support you. I'll back you up. I'll still be proud of you. So that's that was a dichotomy that I was dealing with growing up. Yeah. And I think when I became a teacher... I lean more to my mom's side yeah, because I knew the trauma that I dealt with, not just at school. Yeah. Having a, a Ghanaian name like this. Yeah. <laughs> and then you see, I got that down. And yeah. then, um, <laughs> yeah. And then um, like dealing with just some of the things that my dad would say that was just disparaging and, and just so like detrimental to my spirit. Um, you said man. trauma and detrimental. I, I remember I was being bullied one day and I told one of my parents, this is what happened. And they told me, so why are you crying about it? That was the response. And that caused me to not share. It caused me to, okay, I'm not supposed to talk about these things. And that will impact you as an adult. And I realized that had to be addressed because if I didn't address that, it's going to trickle out to my kids <laughs> and yeah. not need to trickle out into not just my own children. I call the, the kids I teach my kids. Like they are my kids. Uh, they know this too. They're my other kids. Um, but honestly, I think that's why I teach the way I teach. Cause I, I literally remember my childhood and I'm remembering all the different lies that we struggled with as children and how it's not even tenfold now for their generation because of the Instagram and the TikTok and all the technology that they have. Right, they right. Right now more than ever. So when I'm noticing that a child is a little bit insecure, it is, I see it. I see the insecure. It's my job to talk them up. I know 
this is the part where it's my teacher and my parent hat. Like, I'm going to try to bring out the confidence in you because I can't just let you continue going on like that. That'd be me. That's negligent on my part. If I see it and I don't address it, to me, that seems like negligence on my part. I know I'm not their parent. I know that. But honestly, as you, everyone knows this. As educators, we wear multiple hats. Yes. So. We do. Yeah. We do it all. We do it all. I've done the hair. I've done the. <laughs> I've, done the I've done it all. Mrs. Broadus, can you, my, my ponytail came up. Can you fix it? Come here, boo boo. Come here. Yes. And we'll get, mm. we'll get great. Like, yes. Like, the, and that's why I know we're not there yet, but the, I, this season of COVID and how the nation has responded to educators was extremely infuriating to me. Yes. Because we were being told, you guys are not doing anything. Go back into the school building. Excuse me? Mm. Oh, we're not doing anything right now. So preparing the lesson plans that we have to prepare, prepare for a distance learning environment is not doing anything. We weren't doing anything before when we were the psychologist, the mother, the hairdresser, the counselor. We're not doing anything. Really? Like, Mommy, when I say I was infuriated, it's because people don't understand what educators do. They don't understand what we do. They don't understand how much we give of ourselves, sometimes at the expense of our own family, especially during this time of distance learning. There were no proper boundaries in place initially. T t uh, parents and students constantly had access to us because it was virtual. And so you're trying to say that we're not doing anything? Skip me with that, please. <laughs> please. Ooh. Ooh. It, it, you, you are not lying. You are not lying at all. <laughs> I mean, and I'm not even in the classroom this year, but as someone who's been through the trenches, I felt that. And I feel it every time I read a post from somebody who is currently doing virtual learning. So for me, I'm always trying to find ways to empower folks. I mean, that's why I do a lot of the stuff that I do is because yeah. if I can't be in the classroom and be with the students, and do what I love, I need to channel that energy to the educators who are in the trenches, navigating this virtual learning space, taking body blows from all kinds of naysayers, but still staying the course and doing the job that's necessary to impact the kids. In the midst of all the adversity, they still are showing up in front yeah. of those screens. Up. Even when the whole nation starts off by saying, yeah, you guys are heroes to y'all not heroes. Y'all need to get back to work. They're showing up like Kwame. I can only tell you of the number of teachers I've come across who've been riddled with anxiety mm. because of the fact that for those of you guys, who, I'm in Maryland. And so educators in my school district, they haven't gone back to school yet. And I can only tell you the number of teachers who are just like, I'm a fearful of going back. This COVID exposed an issue in our educational infrastructure. That's what it did. It exposed all the iniquities and it, all the all the things that were always there that were never really addressed. The mental health issues, the way that ventilation systems have been sub beyond subpar, and that those have been the environments that um, teachers and students have to teach in. The sanitation issues. Let's not talk about testing because I know it's a hot topic. So we'll just. <sighs> I'm grateful that in our state they they waived um, testing for. I'm so grateful they they find, they listened they listened. If you're gonna tell us that we're going back to address the mental health issues of our students, don't make us go back and have a, have them do testing. That's not helping their mental health. And so they waived all testing for the spring. And I'm just grateful. And I'm like, thank you. At least y'all listen. Right. And before we continue, because. You said something very important, and I think it will be great to segue into this. Okay. Because right now, Teachers for Good Trouble, which is a nonprofit organization that is focused on eliminating standardized testing during mm -hmm. COVID-19 for all the reasons we mentioned, the mm -hmm. trauma, the lack of a focus on social emotional learning for students and, and all the other inequities that we've covered. Not to mention the fact that these tests are still culturally biased, right? Talk so people, it. Maryland is just one state 
that is waived standardized testing. There are a lot of other states that are still moving forward with testing. Yeah. So to ensure that we have more states like Maryland shutting down testing for this year, you can go to the Teachers for Good Trouble website at teachersforgoodtrouble.org, sign the petition. And once you sign the petition, share with your family, share with your parents, share with your students and, and all of your colleagues. Because guess what? The more signatures that we get on that paper, the better. So I just wanted to make sure that I do that PSA because it's important for us to, to amplify this yeah. issue. Yeah. But now let's get to our regular schedule program. So <laughs> we've been talking a lot about our upbringing as Ghanaians and just some of the issues and things that we've had to tackle in our classrooms. But I want to touch on an area that's near and dear to your heart. Let's talk about science because that's a huge part of who you are. It is. And I know we all wear different hats. You're wearing a hat right now. I have my proverbial hat that's invisible that no one can see, but I wear the hat. Um, tell me about what inspired you to start Science with Mrs. Broadus because I know you have your YouTube channel, you have a whole website and a whole bunch of other resources. So talk to us about Science with Mrs. Broadus and what's the overarching mission of the platform? Everything from the channels, the TBT store and everything. You're going to laugh at why I'm about to say what I'm going to say. I actually used to hate oh. science. I hate it. Ironic. See, I say, see, I got you, right? I got you. Yeah. So it was my third year in undergrad where I realized I should change my major, but it was too late um, because the biology classes I had to take, unfortunately, they got less and less interesting, but I had to tough it out because sis had to graduate, right? So the reason why Science with Mrs. Broadus came to be is because I remember my first year teaching where I spent countless hours on YouTube, Google, Pinterest, just looking mm. for different science activities that I can utilize in my science 5e lesson plan that I can engage my students with and I would come up short. And I'm not saying that there are not lesson plans out there, y'all. They're there but they were not engaging to the standard that I was looking for. I Like you have to know your students. You have to know what works with your kiddos. I knew some of the things I was finding, it wasn't gonna work with my kiddos because they, they would just stare at me and be like, what is this? And so from that struggle of trying to find resources for myself, from the anxiety of trying to put together a lesson plan that was semi-decent so that I can reach my kids and help them to learn the science concepts that they needed to learn. That's where this came from. It came, Science with Mrs. Broadus came to be so that I can help educators who teach K, science in K through five not experience the same struggles that I went through. If I can eliminate that for someone else, if I can add value to their lives by providing them with engaging science um, activities that are interactive and hands-on, that's not that's not going to only make their lives easier, but cause their students to be engaged, I was more than willing. If I was able to create activities and resources that will add back to their time, instead of taking away so much time from their family, because they have to spend hours upon hours lesson planning, right? I was willing to do that. And it's really funny because I told you guys my faith is really important. So I remember praying one day, I was like, God, I'm sitting on something that I could use to make passive income. What is it that I'm currently doing that I can use to make passive income? And it's like, what am I doing already? There has to be something, y'all. I was like, what is it that I'm doing already? We're educators. We make lesson plans. We are required to make these lesson plans. People like Kwame, people would reach out to me. They would constantly reach out to me for help with technology issues, with making engaging science activities. Mm. Like teachers in my district would literally send me emails saying, hey, um, can I get that science lesson plan that you shared in our Emoto? Because it was really engaging. And I was like, mm. hmm, okay. So I am all about adding value back to others. And uh, for my fellow teachers out there who might be like me, where you love to help people and you, you love to give, and you give freely, Come I'm going to challenge you to do something. I'm going to challenge you to stop giving away so much. 
Don't stop being who you are. Don't stop being giving. Don't stop being generous. But start to add a price value to your generosity. And let me explain why. You're, you're probably like, Angela, that's not right. That's not what you should be doing. Come on, tell them. Thinking about this, okay? I'm really passionate about generational wealth. I'm really passionate about impact. I'm really passionate about uh, financial legacy. And so really quickly, my background, me and my husband, we're debt free. The only debt that we currently have is our mortgage on our house. That is it. And we plan on paying that off quickly. We plan on leaving a financially stable future for our children and their children's children. That's what, that's what we're about. I need you guys to start thinking about how every single time I, I, we give too much. As educators, we give too much. We give of our time too much. We give of our resources too much. There are times where your educator, your administrator reaches out personally to you. I'm talking to that person who you do the most. You're the leader. So they know that they easily pull things from you. And you're just like, yeah, I'm going to give. I can easily give it away. Stop doing that. Mm. And start requiring that you get paid and that you get the uh, benefits that you should get from being who you are know your worth. I think we need to know, we need to start walking in our worth more. And this is something that like I struggled with at first, but I started setting more boundaries where um, my time is a non-renewable resource. I can always make more money. I can't make more time. So if you're going to use my time, there needs to be a price tag attached to my time as well. Um, and so I started charging people for my lessons and my activities and resources. And I'm going to say, I'm going to be really honest. I was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable because I was so used to just giving. Like Kwame, when I, tell you, when I tell you how <laughs> to this day, <laughs> there's some educators that will reach out to me and be like, hey, can I get your lesson plan? I'm like, here's the link. You can go purchase it. <laughs> because you guys, you're spending hours upon hours of your time creating things, right? You're creating resources. You can monetize that. It's not wrong to monetize it. It doesn't make you a demon person. It doesn't make you, you're not less, you're not less of a giving person if you do so. Mo start monetizing your skills and the things that you do. You can make passive income from some of the things that you already do. And so Science with Mrs. Bratis, um, I was afraid to take the leap, but I took a leap on November 27th, 2020. So it's I've only been in the game for like less than four. What? I know, right? And I started my YouTube channel August of 2020 and the YouTube channel came about because there were so many people kept reaching out to me and I was like, listen, there has to be a way where I can address as many people as possible. If the same people keep coming to me for help with technology and how to engage your students in science, there has to be a way I could reach them. So I created my YouTube platform channel to not only help educators, but to also help parents and students during this time of distance learning. And it was really interesting how it took off. It took off so much so that my science um, curriculum, curriculum supervisor, so I write science curriculum for my school district, she embedded a lot of the videos that I created into our school district's resources. Mm. And I was just like, wow. And so let me give you some reference. So I provide professional development to K-5 educators in my school district, hundreds of educators. I also write science curriculum. Um, this past summer, I was a project manager for our science curriculum writing team. And my curriculum, my direct report or my direct supervisor, she's a woman of color who loves to empower other women of color and other mm. people of color. And oh, I no. can tell you how she has been, Kwame, she's like you, but in curriculum writing. And she's mm. her to try to push as many people to the front as possible, especially people who look like us. She took a whole curriculum writing team that looked primarily not very colored and made it more colorful. She, wow. she, she found people and she was plugging them and she's like, Angela, it's my due diligence to do this if I'm placed in this position. If I had the opportunity to be in this leadership position, I'm going to empower as many people as I can. And I'm so grateful. Tracy, I hope you're listening to this. Actually, you will listen to this. I'm going to send you the link. But so grateful for you, Tracy Belton Walkup. She's amazing. Wow. Phenomenal. And um, if it wasn't for her, honestly, Kwame, I don't think we would be here right now. Because she, she pulled me in. Like, 
hey, are you interested in curriculum writing? Send me a lesson. And literally that's how I just got plugged in that way. I don't have a master's in curriculum and instruction. Like she saw potential, pulled me in, and it's been like that ever since. And because of that, Kwame, I've had opportunities where like we're talking about science with Mrs. Broadus. I was creating YouTube videos, but then I also got pulled in to do some work for my school district where I had to create videos, science lessons for students who did not have access to technology during distance learning. So these are videos that they would play on TV, on the cable, for different channels on Verizon or wow. depending on what they had access to. And the students were able to watch it. And <laughs> my curriculum writer, my curriculum supervisor, she sent me, I remember she sent me a text message. I was in the middle of class one day. She's like, Angela, you're on TV. And I'm like, wait, what? And so they had like featured one of my lessons on the our local ABC News talking about the overcoming the technology divide that came with distance learning. Mm. And so all these different opportunities have come my way is because, you know, we have people, you guys, if you're in a position of leadership or influence where you can help others, push them up front. Let them let them be, let them stand on your shoulder because you you got to where you are somehow for a reason. Don't just be so selfish that you're holding on to it. But that's not what we're talking about. Science with Mrs. Broadus came about because of my desire to help others and um, also to create passive income. And Kwame, I make money in my sleep. So it's been pretty great. Oh, that's the best part. And, I, and listen, yeah. <laughs> listen, I have a whole bunch of questions that I was going to ask, but I'm going to call an audible. And just stay on this track right here because it's so important what you're saying. Mm -hmm. The idea of educators taking control of their intellectual property mm -hmm. and using it as a way to monetize mm -hmm. off of their talents. And, you know, for me, I didn't have that click until later on in my career, until I got to year eight. So when I got to year eight, I wrote my book, Shape of the Teacher Identity, A Lessons That Help to Find Teacher in You, right? Yeah. I wrote this while I was on paternity leave with my son, who's now three years old, running around causing all kinds of havoc, right? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and what's crazy is I wrote it as a passion project. I didn't write it with the mindset of starring an LLC. Mm -hmm. But what's crazy is we think about all of our creations, right? And I posted about this a few days ago on, on Instagram. It's all about planting that one seed. That one seed. And watching it multiply into all these different iterations and, and different creations. Like, yep. like this podcast would not have happened if I didn't write this book and if people and y'all, y'all can see the title of the book. It says shape the teacher identity, right? My IG handle is Quam the identity shaper. Now you all can see why, because it started with this book. The name of my company is identity talk consulting LLC. Why is it called identity talk? Because guess what? It started with this book, this one seed. And then, of course, we have Identity Talk Aparo and, and everything else. So you can see the, the vertical alignment mm -hmm. of all the different creative things that have come out of the one book. Isn't that and amazing? I've been able to leverage it with school districts. Come on. I've been able to leverage it with different teacher residencies. Come on. I've been able to leverage it with individual educators mm -hmm. and even folks who aren't even in education. Because what's crazy is I was an IP student who struggled with speech. Wow. I'm not even supposed to be here right now. I'm not even wow. supposed to be talking to you right now. My IP was an expressive speech because I was the kid who would who would draw pictures as opposed to engage in a verbal conversation with somebody wow. because I was so insecure with my speech skills. 
so insecure. And now you look at me 30 plus years later. I'm on. I'm doing podcasts, talking to all kinds of educational experts. And I wrote a whole book, which, of course, I self-publish. Right? No one taught me how to self-publish. I went on YouTube and learned. I um, learned. Imagine <laughs> what would have happened if you didn't take that leap of faith. None of this, not like, I don't think, I think some of you guys have to realize something. You guys are sitting on an idea or a dream and people are waiting on the other side of it. Come on, talk about it. Like I, we wouldn't be talking right now if Kwame didn't write that book. The virtual summit, oops, that he's gonna be talking about soon. It wouldn't have happened. Yeah. All the opportunities um, that has come his way wouldn't have been possible if he had not taken the time, took a leap of faith and wrote that book. It's crazy. Like I even think about science. I never thought I would be able to redeem science back in a way that I had been able to redeem it again. And science is one of those things, it's, it was a love-hate relationship. Hate because it was gr a gruesome four years in my undergrad. I had went through, <laughs> my institution was pretty rigorous and it was grueling, but I've been able to find the love of it again and remember why I loved it and be able to share that love with other students in a way that pushes them and to me, science is not just science. It's literally, there's so much to it. It teaches you critical thinking skills mm -hmm. and skills. It helps them to, and when people are like, oh, math is the only thing that's important. Reading is the only thing that's important. Science helps bring it all together. And that's what's really funny to me because I know that oftentimes people are like, oh, I don't really teach science. You are doing your students a disservice because not only if you teach them science will you expose them to the concepts, you help them with their informational text abilities and helping them decipher the information. You help Come them on. be able to construct explanations using evidence and data, which is extremely important nowadays. You help them with their inquiry skills. Hello, mm. does that not sound like reading and math to you? You help them in so many different areas. It all comes together. Science is it's that beautiful transdisciplinary content and subject that brings everything together. And honestly, the thing that's really scary right now is that we're falling, America is falling behind. <laughs> oh, if you look wow. at the data, we are behind a lot of countries. We're behind some even third world countries right now. When it, when you're looking at education as a whole and when you're looking at science, it's a problem. And that's why there are things like the Next Generation Science Standards. I, I love the Next Generation Science Standards not because of how it's aligned with Common Core, that's not why I like it. I like it because it digs deeper and it gives mm. you specifics as an educator for, okay, what are the concepts that the students should be able to master? And I'm not gonna lie to you, Kwame, there are some educators I've spoken to that are like, a kindergartner shouldn't be able to do that much, that's too much. Why are you capping them? Do you know how inquisitive they are at, as a kindergartner? Like even my son, when, whenever we're going for walks, he's pointing out so many different things. Why are we capping their abilities? Why are we seeing that they're not able to do X, Y, Z and the other? You don't know that, like they're they're able to do a lot more than we give them credit for. Kids are able to do a lot more than what we give them credit for. I'm doing a virtual coding club with my students. Yes, it's a virtual coding club. And one of my students, a third grader said, hey, Mrs. Broadus, when are we actually gonna do like the lines of coding? Wow. I was Come like, really? we're using visual blocks so that you can understand the coding concepts so that when you get to middle school, wow. <laughs> you can do the real coding. He was so eager, like he was hungry for it. You guys, we have to do better. And like science is one of those areas where you can allow the students to explore in so many different ways. Kwame, I don't know if you heard about, there was a, was he 12 years old? I need to remember. He is currently <laughs> doing his PhD. It's a very young, he's young. He is young. I'm gonna find the article. I think I, I, I read that article. He's that, very it sounds young. familiar. He, he's he's a he's African American and he's getting it in one of the sciences. Very bright, very intelligent. You guys, the possibilities are endless with our children. And so, when you take away science, you're literally robbing your students of an opportunity to dig deeper, to dig deeper with their inquiry skill, skills, to dig deeper with their observations, to dig deeper with playing with data. And what's really interesting is you're like, okay, so what? 
our whole country has been, have we, have we not been using data currently when it comes to COVID mm. indicators? And to sure have. have sure we not? Have. <laughs> I mean, like I know from my school district, they told us, oh, we're not gonna open unless we see the data reflecting this, that, and the other. If we rob students of the ability to do science, how are they going to be able to be able to properly decipher data so that we no longer get into situations where the government might say one thing, but the data says another thing, and we can't tell the difference between the two, and we just take the government for its word? Are we not going right. to teach students how to be critical thinkers and how to be able to, when people give them, say, oh, this is, this is fact, help them fact check. They need to learn how to do all these different things. Science teaches them how to do that. And so I'm really passionate about science in ways that I told you I hated it in the beginning and I did, but it was birthed from that love-hate relationship. I got to where I am now to a point where when I'm talking to my students, I have students who say, Mrs. Broadus, I'm not gonna lie to you. I didn't like science before. I love it now. And I'm like, I'm happy. If they choose to use science later down the road, cool. If they don't, cool. But guess what? They learned the, the skills that they need in order to be successful wherever they go. Business, music, Wherever they decide to go, they have those skills that they can still use. So, yeah. And if you think about it, it's not about the content area. It's not about all you mentioned right there is about agency. Agency, agency, agency. How do we get our young people to develop ownership of what they're learning and to use it as a way to translate it into these different fields? that they'll eventually get into, whether it's business, whether it's music, whether it's in technology, whatever they aspire to do. Yes. The skills are what's transferable. Yes. And if we can get our kids to think along those lines, they will then question the very curriculum that they're being taught. Oh my and God, say it again, please. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna run, run it back. <laughs> If we can get our young people, okay, to develop this agency and these skills of inquiry, not just in science, but in all their other content areas, all their content areas. they will then have the ability to question, to yes. interrogate, yes, and to inquire about the very curriculum which they are being taught. Yes. Especially for our students who look like you and I. Because we, about it, yeah. because we all, because we know that there's a hidden curriculum yep. that's not being taught to them. Yeah. There's a hidden curriculum that's not being taught to them. And that's what's preventing them from being those next millionaires. Yeah. That's what's preventing them from even understanding their own identity culturally yep. and socially. Yeah. So we have to unpack this hidden curriculum and hold school districts accountable for teaching said curriculum. You better talk about it. Kwame, I and also teach social studies. And so <laughs> our social studies textbook, oh, it's so outdated. And so I don't want to talk about the social studies curriculum. It's so horrible. They still talk about Columbus. It's so bad. But my kids, this is what I appreciate about this generation and how they have access to, te to technology. Mm -hmm. I remember my kids were like, Mrs. Broadus, this doesn't seem right. And I'm like, really? Please tell me more. How does this not seem right? The kids are starting to realize and understand that just because it's in a textbook, it doesn't mean it's right or correct or factual or it's reflective of true history. And, mm. and and we go there. We I I told you guys I am that teacher. So oh we'll do social studies. You want me to do social? I will do social studies. And you want me to use that curriculum? Sure. And I will teach the kids how to fact check. Okay, you guys, this is what this is what it says. What do you guys think about this? And I had the I literally had the students. We have these different. We have these conversations. These deep conversations where we start talking about. What do you guys think about how what happened with how the colonists came to America and what happened to the Native Americans? Let's talk about it. Let's dig deeper. How would you feel if someone just came into your house and took it over and said, you have to leave? Mm. You react. Like we have these mm. conversations, we go deeper. And then the kids are like, that's not fair. I didn't, I didn't tell them it was not fair. They came to that conclusion themselves. Come we were just on, discussing it. Come on. 
come on, agency, agency. Yeah. You did not give them the answer. <laughs> you didn't put it on a silver platter and say, hey, I need you to repeat this 50 million times so that when we go into this test, you can go ahead and write it exact verbatim. Mm -hmm. No, but so much of our education system is all about that, yeah. that rote memorization. Yeah. And as somebody who grew up in the 90s, Oof. you know, as an elementary school student, Oof. that's how I got through K to 12, through rote memorization. Remember our, talk. our multiplication facts? <laughs> we didn't, listen, we didn't get taught no lattice method, partial products method, like, what the heck is going on these days? All I got taught was a standard algorithm for how to multiply. Now you got to learn how to deal with the area model, with the lattice method, with the partial products method, with this other method, just to learn how to multiply. And I understand when we think about Common Core, because that's 90 plus percent of our country, they use some iteration of the Common Core framework to teach how to do multiplication three different ways, at least three different ways. And my whole thing is, is that even relevant? Do we really need to know how to do it all those different ways? How about we just get to the answer and they're able to do it one way, that should be good enough. But there's too much nuance in our system, too much nuance. And we need to break it down and simplify that because I just feel like Education is this profession that a lot of our common sense solutions are totally uncommon. Uh, common sense is not common anymore, though. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, education is that one profession. Maybe not that one profession, but it's one of the professions where a lot of the solutions that are out there are common sense solutions. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. they're uncommon in our yeah. field. We tend to overcomplicate things, things such as culturally responsive teaching. Now, mm -hmm. I love Zaretta Hammond. I love Dr. Ladson Billings. They are people who have contributed to this very theory, mm -hmm. and they do great work. I just feel like no one should have to pick up a book to know how to be a culturally responsive teacher. And I'm going to tell you why, because guess what? We're both parents. Mm -hmm. When it's time for our son's birthday, right? Mm -hmm. We don't just go to any store and just pick up whatever, just whatever toy that we catch, you know, with our eyes, right? We actually think about what our children will like. Yeah. What's going to bring them joy to the point where when they see it, they're like, Daddy, I love it. Yeah. We take our time. We invest in our children, yeah. our own children. Yeah. And that transcends racial lines. So yeah. what I want to know is how can we can't take that same mindset and apply it to our students? Mm -hmm. How can we can't get to know our students at that same level? How can we can't exert that same energy into our students to the point where we can say we're experts on our students, just like we're experts on our children? Because some people don't care that much and they're not Thank that invested. You. And it's just for a paycheck. At Kwame, there have been times where there's nothing wrong with a union. I love my union. My school union mm. kept me protected, but sometimes they keep us protected to the fault where. Mm -hmm educators who should not be here anymore where they yeah. collect the paycheck because they're here to collect the pay paycheck they do the very bare minimum that's not even the bare minimum and the kids feel that they sense that and then you're wondering why there's so many disciplinary issues and classroom management problems and why they're not able to do a proper lesson plan some people are in education who should not be there for real for real like real talk and the kids know that too and so they start acting out um, and so I think it goes back to, and I don't know how to fix it. This has been an issue where literally there are times where I'm just thinking like, how do you fix this issue? Like, how do you really fix this issue? It's a, it's a person. It's the person. If I don't care, if I'm not invested, if I don't see the value, I'm not going to put in the effort. 
what happens when people don't have the character and they really don't care? How do you how do you fix that? How do you truly fix that? Mm. How do you, you want to make someone you want to make all teachers culturally responsive? They have to have some level of care. They have to see the value in the people in front of them. If I don't value my students, if I'm just here to collect the paycheck. So it's been, yeah. You, you brought up, philo- th- these are the philosophical problems to me because I'm like, I'm really looking for a tangible solution. I know it exists, it's out there somewhere, but how do we make it more feasible? I'm sorry, guys. I'm not sorry. That's my, my three-year-old in the basement. No. <laughs> Guess <laughs> what? It's his, it's his house too. He, he's house supposed too. to be there, right? He's, he's supposed to be there. there. So y'all get to <laughs> real life, mama, mompreneur. This is my life. I'm an educator. I'm a mom. I'm a teacherpreneur. This is all of it. So ever so, even on my YouTube videos, there's definitely one video you heard my son in the back. I'm like, hey you guys, that's my son as well. And as we were talking about before, you gotta keep it moving. That's real life. Listen, and before we get to the lightning round, which will be a super lightning round, um, I have to point this out. So. When I prepared for this interview, well, with any interview that I do with my guest, I have my set of questions. Yeah. And depending on the flow of the conversation, I don't always get to all the questions. You can get to all the it's questions. Totally fine. <laughs> so with this interview, there are like maybe four or five questions that I was going to ask you, but I was like, you know what? This is how the conversation is supposed to go. Mm-hmm. And why am I mentioning this? Because so often in our education system, you have teachers who are so about following the script. Talk about it. That they miss out on the teachable moments. That's it. They they miss the cues. Mm -hmm. They miss the kids with their heads down on the desk. Yeah. They miss the kids with the confused faces. They miss the kids with the dumbfounded faces. Yeah. They miss out on all these people and they don't make the necessary adjustments on the fly. Yeah. That is what good teaching is about. Yeah. That is what good pedagogy is about, mm-hmm. is being able to make executive decisions about the curriculum, yeah. but also about your instructional technique. Yeah. And so many of us are too scared to make those decisions because we're afraid of ridicule we're afraid of backlash and the feedback that we might get from our supervisor, from our evaluator. And we need to eradicate that fear from Ooh. teachers, especially those who are coming out of these practicums. Yeah. Don't so I just had to point that. That. There's no reason to be afraid. Can I be honest with you? Kwame, can I tell you the number of times where I was evaluated and I got less than what I... So initially, you know, so you get evaluated, then you have the conference, the post-observation conference. And I I learned you need to close mouths, don't get fed. You need to know, you need to know how you're being evaluated and you need to know how to identify what evidence is sufficient enough for you to get a certain rating or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Remember, I got like there was something I got basic on or proficient. The highest level we could get is distinguished. And I challenged my admin. I was like, this should be distinguished. And they're like, why do you say that? I'm like, well, here's the evidence. Here's the evidence. Here's the evidence from the lesson, pictures. Listen, I am playing that game with y'all. We look, so you guys speak, you guys, need, we need to do better on speaking up for ourselves. And don't just go with, oh, they gave me this. So that's, ha- that's what it has to be. No, it doesn't. That's not what it, it doesn't have to be that way. If you're a teacher who's be cur- currently evaluated and you know for a fact you should be higher up on the rank, study whatever manual you use. So we use um, the FFT framework manual. I, I have the book, It's tab- it was tabbed when I was being evaluated. So I saw the evidence that I needed. Okay, this is what I need to get distinguished. But I know the type of teacher that I am. I know I know the type of teacher that I am. And guess who got distinguished moving forward ever forth? Awesome. Okay, so you guys don't just roll over with whatever it, that comes your way or Oh, I received basic or, oh, they're telling me I need to do this and I'm the teacher. You got to know your rights. You got to know your worth. You got to know who you are and you need to step up appropriately and represent yourself, please. And guess what? Once again, we're talking about agency, right? Mm -hmm. Because 
you took it upon yourself to learn the rubric, learn the indicators. How many educators actually do that? And and also, how can we teach our students how to build agency in their learning if we as educators are modeling it in our own practice? Mm-hmm. Like, how is that even possible, right? Mm-hmm. So I want to know from you, in your district or even in your state, yeah. for your evaluation process, do yeah. you have to submit artifacts yes. as documentation? Because I know we had to do that in Boston. Like, I'm taking pictures yep. to provide evidence. Mm-hmm. So what about you? Same thing? You need pictures. You need mm-hmm. the- you need the exit tickets or whatever assessment you use. You need to This is a thing, you guys. Um, Kwame talked about learning how to pivot and learning how to identify those teachable moments. That's a part of your observation, too. So I know for us in Maryland, well, in, in particular in my school district, there's a section about reflecting on your teaching and what are some things that you had to do in the midst of your lesson in order to um, adjust your lesson or whatever the case may be. You can you can get distinguished on that too. Yeah, you may have like written down your whole lesson. This is what was supposed to happen, but this is what actually happened because a student had an inquiry and this inquiry led the instruction. We want student-led instruction. We're, we're trying to move away from teacher-led instruction. The student should be guiding the instruction to begin with anyway. Um, and why is that important? If they're guiding the instruction, whatever concepts that you're trying to teach them and you feel like you're, oh my goodness, I need to hurry up and get through this lesson and so I have to stick on script. Let the students guide the instruction and you'll be amazed as to how much they will walk away with and how much little work you have to do. I kid you not. (laughs) Come on, come on. Kwame, I had a student, she scored, we have a a science district assessment. She only missed one question out of Mm. the whole class. One question bright, intelligent, and she was the one who's constantly asking questions. Mrs. Broaddus, that doesn't make sense. How's that so, How's that even relevant? She was that student who would literally rally everyone else around and be like, and they would question everything. Did I, was I upset? No, go ahead, question everything because it led them, it, it, ha- it had them take initiative of their own learning, which I love mm-hmm. always. So yeah, that's good. Wow, 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 wow. And here's another thing I just thought of going back to the evaluation discussion, right? Yeah. Let's say that you're having an observation or an evaluation. The lesson is going south. Okay. It's just a bad lesson all all around. Kids aren't responding the way that you expected. You don't don't have a plan B or whatever, right? Yeah. This is where being a reflective practitioner can come in handy and could probably salvage your rating. Mm Mm-hmm. Because typically, in a good school, your administrator will do a post-evaluation conference with you to debrief the whole experience. Yeah. And typically, if the lesson doesn't go as well as it should, they're naturally going to ask you the question, what do you believe went wrong with the lesson? Mm -hmm. Can you actually pinpoint, can you identify those specific parts of the lesson where you can improve and things went south. And if you're able to articulate that Mm -hmm. in a way that demonstrates your understanding of your shortcomings and where you can improve by just doing that, you're giving your supervisor the impression that you are being cognizant and reflective about your practice and yeah. you're not just chalking it up to say, oh, man, the kids were just off the hook today. They just weren't oh. responding. Um, <laughs> it's not me. I hate it's when not I me. Say, it's like, them. Like That hurts me. I hate when I see that. Kwame, it happens so often. As teachers, we're not always teachable. And I mm. get that. There's mm. some, some level of pride. But we expect our students to be teachable. But we can't be teachable ourselves. Do as I say, not as I do. Come on. What we're doing right now, as educators, we need to be understanding the fact we're not always going to be right. It's human. So how are you being reflective of who you are as an educator and how are you adjusting accordingly? I can't, I'll use my, I'll throw myself under the bus. This year, first quarter of virtual learning, uh, 
mm, let's look at the data. 67% of my fifth graders were failing science first quarter, virtual wow. learning. Now, I had two options. I could have been like, oh, they're just not doing their work. It's all on them. Or I could do option B. What is it as an educator that I need to do? How can I pivot my instruction in order to better meet their needs and cater to their needs? You can guess which option I chose. I chose B. The latter, and sure. Can I, can I be honest with you guys? And people were like, no, it's the students' fault. It's the virtual learning. No kids can learn during virtual learning. I beg to differ. Kids can learn during... My current fifth graders are now thriving in virtual learning because I made a pivot. I I reflected on my educational practices during this time. Was it ideal? No, but I made necessary changes. And guess what? In second quarter, 90% of our fifth graders had A's or B's. And wow. Second, we went from 7% to 90% having A's and B's. And some of you guys are like, that's not possible. You must have made numbers up or stuff. I didn't. I reflected on my practices in first quarter and I made the necessary changes and they were successful. And the data shows that they were successful too. And you talk to these students, they're like, they're like, Mrs. Brown, this is much better. Now. <laughs> I better differentiated my instruction. I made sure I was reaching, meeting my ELL learners, my students with disabilities. I was making sure mm. I was making visual learners. There's some students, they're auditory and visual. Okay, how am I meeting their needs in this virtual learning environment? There's some students who are hands-on. How am I meeting their needs in this virtual learning environment? You make the necessary adjustments and you pivot. And there you go. So, yeah. I threw myself under the book so you know that we all, we were always learning how to be teachable. There are times where I've made the mistake of not being humble. And I'm like, it's not me, it's them. That was, that's not humility. I knew that on my part, that was pride and that was not me being teachable. And I had to go back and be honest with myself. Some of us, we're not always honest with ourselves. We're not always honest about how we truly are as educators. We put ourselves on a higher pedestal than we need to be on. And we need to take it down a couple of notches and be completely transparent with ourselves about how am I operating as an educator right now? What wow. change do we need to make? So, yeah. Wow. And we could talk about this we all can. night. <laughs> we really can talk about this all night. I'm looking at the time right now. We're going on almost an hour and a half, which was not my expectation for this interview. But you know what? I'm loving every minute of it. And this is just what it means to just be a teacher. Sometimes you got to just go with the flow. Yeah. You just got to go with the flow, especially when we're getting to a really good destination. Yes. And we're supposed to be talking about just science and science, but yeah. you know what? <laughs> There's so much about this conversation that teachers need to take yeah. from it, right? There's just so many gems that were dropped throughout this interview. And I'm just so happy that we took it there, that we pivoted. And I called the audible and we we said what we said because I didn't plan this. We this didn't was not plan. This is not a part of the question. This was that not planned. It just happened that way. And yeah. I feel like if more of our educators took the same approach and they were just okay with letting go. Yes. If they were just okay with relinquishing control. Yes. And just letting their students, as you mentioned, be the guide to yes. the learning process. Yes. We'll see so many more changes within our education system if we just relinquish that control and give the students the autonomy to thrive and, and to be their own guides of, in this process, as opposed to us always dictating how things are going to go. If I just followed that script that I left with the questions, if I just simply read every single question that's on my list, the conversation would not be as fruitful as it is right now. And that's a fact. Yeah, that's a fact. Whoo, man! It was good. <laughs> oh my goodness! Um, but I I do want to do uh, do a quick lightning round. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do yeah, it. it's gonna be super quick. That's fine. I know I always say lightning round, but you know what? That lightning round ends up being a whole half hour because people no. get real deep. We have to go. Oh, now we're gonna be real quick today. <laughs> okay, so I have. Two questions that I'm definitely going to ask you. Go ahead. Shoot. Uh, number one, given that 
you are Ghanaian, just like I am. I just got to know, how would you rate your tree skills? One to five. <laughs> five being like super proficient, one being uh, not, not so good. We had this conversation before Kwame. Definitely a one. You see, I could be honest with myself. I know where I am. I know oh, my. Yeah. This is the thing. I I am receptively bilingual. Some of you guys are like, that's not a real word. It actually is. Apparently, I thought I coined it. I should have. I should have copyrighted it. <laughs> trademark that. Trademark word. that. You should trademark <laughs> that. Wait, it's been used elsewhere. And so, what oh. is that? It means that I'm really good at someone could could talk to me in tree, and I'll just respond to them in English, um, because I know what they're saying. If they want me to respond in tree, it'll take me a good. 10 minutes to follow mm. so, but at least I understand what they're saying. Hello, and you guys, in all fairness, before you judge me, because there's some of you guys who are down here and you're judging me right now, no one taught me tree. My mom did not know that I understood tree until I was 16 years old, and she was like, Who taught you that? And I'm like, How am I supposed to know? <laughs> so, my parents didn't know I understood tree. So, in all fairness, I have a case as to why I don't understand my language, right. So. That's what's up. That's what's up. Because I know for me, I lived in Ghana for three years in my during my teenage years. And in that time, like I was able to pick up a lot of the language. Now, can I speak it? No. But it's more of a confidence thing. Like I can speak, I can actually do like phrases. Like I do basic phrases. I, mean, yeah. I can tell you what different verbs are and things like that like i have a foundation yeah i yeah. believe that if i was in an environment if i was living in ghana where i was forced to have to speak tree mm -hmm. i'll be good yeah. because i already have it it's up there it's just that i don't have anybody to speak it with other than my mama my tongue is not catching up with my brain <laughs> that's what i like to say my yeah at the speed my brain is so my brain is computing everything that people say to me in tree it's just that my tongue is you know yeah not there yet right and uh my final question is which country in africa has the best jollof rice why would you do this <laughs> i can answer this question without bias there's and only one answer there is only one answer and i'm going to use data and evidence to support my answer so Come on now church there's when people try to create a jollof war because my church is primarily nigerian and then there's some of us from ghana and then there's you know blacks whites all that we're pretty multicultural so someone tried to start a jollof war and they're like Ghanaian jollof is trash it's nasty i didn't i didn't have to say anything i didn't even have to defend myself that they're like you haven't tried angela's jollof rice oh that means you haven't had good jollof go you have some of the angela's jollof i have black people who have said Ghanaian jollof is better than Nigerian jollof. My best friend who's Nigerian, she's like, oh, your jollof rice is bomb. I have Nigerian people who've told me in secret because they refuse to say this publicly because of Nigerian pride. They're like, this Ghanaian jollof is on point. So, duh. <laughs> I love it. And we got it on video. That's yes. fine. I, I'm going to clip that portion and I'll share it on my IG when all the nice go. come for me. I'm going to be like, but haven't you also eaten my jalap and you love it too? So, what's the well, how about? Okay. There you go. <laughs> Ooh, there's going to be some trouble. There's going to be some trouble, but I'm all for it. All right. And um, real quickly, Angela, before you go, yes. as I mentioned, we have our Stay True to Teaching You virtual summit, and you are one of the presenters. So I need you to make a strong case for this summit. Cause we're trying to get some people to register. We're trying to get some people to, to tap into this learning experience like no other. You need to register a snap. Tell them why. Let them know. So it's really interesting. I'll give you the practical reason. I'm a practical person. I like to see how this will you know, come back to me in a tangible way as well. So yes, there's so many nuggets and gems you're gonna walk away from. The sessions are going to be on point. They're going to be amazing. Kwame has selected some amazing presenters. But outside of all the information you're about to get, so my school district, you need a certain amount of PD credit in order to qualify for recertification and in order to, you know, jump up on the pay scale. 
Anyone else trying to get more, you know, coin? I mean, this is how much do you usually pay in order to get PE credit from a class or an online institution? How much do you typically have to pay? Oh, hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Lots of money. You're only paying how much in order to join this virtual summit and attend and not only walk away with the tangible, tangible gems, but you also get PD credits? Come on. For a relatively low cost? Hello, cost effective. Hello, not you guys. Even, not even triple digits. Not even not triple digits. Digits. You guys jump on this. Do not sleep on it. Trust me, you will kick yourself in the butt. I know I had some educators reach out to me. They they sent me a text. They're like, Angela, when does the early bird cost end? They caught it before it ended. Unfortunately, for some of you guys, you may not have caught it before it ended. It's not too late to register, though. Go and register. Don't hesitate. When payday comes, set aside some of that money and put it towards your summit ticket. You will not regret it. It will be an experience to live for. And not only that, you get six weeks worth of replay. Come on, Action. let them know. Let okay. Them know. I'm being so serious. This is something you definitely want to take advantage of, especially if you're in education, especially if you are first year, second year, third year teacher, or maybe you're not there. You're a 10th year, 16th year, 20th year teacher. You can still benefit from this conference. And there's so many different tips and gems you will walk away from from each session. I'm looking forward to the self-care sessions. I know I'm presenting as well. And I should be like selfish to say like I'm looking forward to my session the most. But honestly, in addition to being able to teach you guys what I know and my knowledge, I'm looking forward to how we can also be, become better emotionally. Because let's be honest, COVID has been tough on a lot of educators in this season. Yes, it has. It's been burnt out. Some of us have a lot of anxiety. Some of us, you're doing okay, but you're, you're borderline red zoning, redlining. Right, right, right. Conference, it will change your life and if not we could talk about it later send me a dm <laughs> all right and just to qualify everything that angela said i'm just gonna flash this again look at the people who we have here listen we we have principal rock coming from compton and he's got his conference going on this weekend the revolutionary educator conference we have brian keith harris the preacher the minister Always preaching that good word, that educational gospel. We have Dr. Sean Woodley from Teach, Hustle, Inspire. You see people rocking the shirts. Mm -hmm. We have Teach for the Culture and Shauna Brown. We got superstar educators, y'all. Superstar educators who are tapping in and sharing and pouring into you all for four days. And what's great about it? You don't have to leave your home. Mm -hmm. You can stay where you are, right in front of your screen. And even if you don't get to all the sessions within those four days, you got six more weeks to watch everything. It doesn't get any better than this. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this, as an educator, as someone that was in the classroom, opportunities like this never came about in my district. Mm -hmm. Well, in all the districts I taught in. So, yeah, yeah tap in, y'all. So we still have registration up until April 15th. If you're a principal, if you are an administrator, superintendent, who's looking to bring a whole group of teachers to this summit, we have group discounts for groups of 10 or more teachers. So please tap in, reach out to uh, myself, whether it's through social media or even email at identitytalkforeducators.com and we can answer those questions for you. But this is an experience that you don't want to miss out on. And Angela, sister, I got to thank you for just taking the time to share your story, taking the time to spread all this wisdom pro bono, I might add. Cause you ain't charged nobody. You just went ahead and just shared <laughs> a whole bunch. But but that's love though. That's love that's, because that's the giving part of me. That's it. If I can have people learn from my struggle, why would I withhold that information from you? And there have been times now. where people have been have said to me, "I want to purchase a product that you've created, but I can't afford it." I've given it to them for free, 
and I just tell them all I need you to do, go leave a review. So, and tell me how your students enjoy the product and, or how I can improve it. You have to know how to be flexible. You need to know how to pivot. You need to know how to know when to charge and when to, okay, I'm walking in generosity. I know that's sort of counter what I said before, but you have to have a- There's a balance. There's a balance. And also you need to have the emotional intelligence and the relational intelligence to know when what is appropriate in each circumstance and situation. So Kwame, thank you so much for having me. It was definitely a pleasure. You have been killing it. I know I keep telling you time and time again, and it's not because I'm trying to flatter him with words, you guys. I'm trying to give him his roses because he deserves his roses. He's done a phenomenal job. And so I'm grateful. I know so many other educators have been grateful as well. So thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you continue to do and all the ground that you're laying down ahead of us so thank you thank you so much thank you angela and real quickly how can people tap into you via social media let them know your handles let them know so at, at ang.broadus that's instagram you can find me on facebook at angela broadus in parentheses mensa so that's another way Kwame and i connected he has my brother's name, my dad's first name, and my maiden name. So that was, I was like, that's another way we connected. But um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. You can go to my website, www.sciencewithmrsbrodis.com, and you can learn more about me there. And you can reach out to me there. You can ske schedule a calendar calendly through my website as well. But I'm there. I'm a pretty open person. I don't just talk about education. I believe in being well-rounded. Yeah. Uh, so I talk about my life. As a mother, you will see my son on there often. They talk about my faith. I talk about, I'm really huge on character and integrity and just building up your inner life because what's on the inside comes out on the outside and it shows up in the classroom. So if I'm not taking care of my emotional health and my mental health, then my kids are suffering and the people around me are suffering as well. So I talk a little bit about that as well. And yeah, so I'm pretty well-rounded. I'll talk about my teacher stories and all that jazz. So if you like, you know, well-rounded things, you can find me there. And I love to connect with people. I'm a people person. So just send me a DM saying hi and I'll respond back. So, yeah. Yes. And um, if you're on Clubhouse, you can reach out <laughs> to her as well. She's definitely yeah. on Clubhouse and she is all about being well-rounded. She is in all the rooms. I am. Not just educator <laughs> rooms. <laughs> in all the rooms so you can okay. tell she's a student she's a student when it comes to this craft mm -hmm. no doubt about it yeah thank you so much again Kwame really appreciate it all right Angela thank you again and we'll be talking very soon yes we will all right have a good rest of the day you too all right and there you have it folks Another episode of I Dane Talk for Educators Live is coming to an end. And as I always say to you, wish you a good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And we're going to do this again another time. Peace out, good people.